as parents, we absolutely have to see that our first responsibility, and in a certain sense, our last responsibility, is to bequeath uh, the Orthodox faith to our children. If the children see the parents engaged in a secular life, the likelihood is that the children will be engaged in a secular life. Children cannot learn how to struggle if they do not see their parents engaged in their own interior struggle. And that doesn't mean perfection on the part of the parents. It means struggle. It means, it might even mean that they see the parent have a bad day and use foul language and then pick themselves up and say, you know, I shouldn't have spoken that way and start again. Because so much of the spiritual life is picking yourself up and starting again. Father John Summers, who has been a clergyman for over 15 years, is the founder as well as the headmaster of the St. John of Damascus Orthodox Educational Initiative, the mission of which is to provide educational opportunities grounded in an Orthodox Christian worldview, to educate the faithful about the dangers of secularized educational institutions, and to produce a full Orthodox curriculum for grades K through 12. Father John has a varied and deep academic background, and together with his wife, Presbyterian Marina Summers, has homeschooled their eight children. He is currently an adjunct lecturer at the St. Photios Orthodox Theological Seminary, and we are honored to have him over for tea. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Tea Time at the Seminary. I am really excited today to be talking to Father John Summers. So, Father John Summers, thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Thank you for having me. Today, we are going to be drinking Earl Grey tea. Uh, Father John, I understand that you have an English background. And I think Earl Grey comes from England, right? Indeed. Okay. On my father's side, yes. Oh, okay, yeah. very good. We're going to talk about the St. John of Damascus Orthodox Educational Initiative and just modern education in general. So the first question I'm going to ask you is what is the initiative and what led to its creation? Okay. Um, well, the initiative is first and foremost a program, a primary and secondary program for Orthodox students to have a secular and ecclesiastical education um, a, a structure for actually learning. Um, and really to explain that, we have to think about um, what led up to it, which is that, you know, my wife and I always homeschooled. We noticed, we were both trained teachers ourselves. My wife is a Latin teacher, um, and I taught history in public school as well as other subjects, philosophy, so forth. Um, but we, we always noticed that one of the most difficult things to accomplish, having a big family and homeschooling, was to provide structure. So we had, on, one, on the one hand, we had the deficits of, that we saw in the public schools, both spiritually and intellectually. But on the other hand, we had the challenge of maintaining structure. And in the background here, um, I think we have to have the verse from the psalmist, right? Goodness and knowledge and discipline teach thou me. Um, we felt that our, our, our own children were learning goodness and knowledge in the homeschool context, but th there wasn't enough discipline, right? Um, there wasn't enough regularity. And really the reason that is, is because what would be the best would be to have Orthodox parochial schools. So the initiative was created to, to create both a curriculum and a program that would provide both the instruction and the regularity in the delivery of that instruction. We're up to 61 students, uh, primary and secondary right now. Um, the adult discussion groups have not started for the fall yet, but we already have about 20 signed up, so we're up to about 81 students uh, at present, but we'll probably have an increase in the next month or so. So do these students come from different countries, or are they all mo mostly just American? Uh, most of them are American, but we have students all over the world. We have, we have students in Serbia, we have students uh, in England, um, we've had students in Russia, although the time zones provide, you know, <laughs> present sort of, sort of a challenge there, um, and we have students throughout the United States and Canada. And before the cameras were rolling, we were talking a little bit about this. So why is it called the initiative as opposed to just calling it like St. John of Damascus School? Ah, well, so we're not yet accredited, so we can't legally call ourselves a school. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about how we ensure uh, quality and so forth in, with respect to that. But the reason it's called an initiative is because what many people noticed that we're at the center of the creation of the initiative, and especially Metropolitan Moses, is that our church wasn't be, was not uh, being proactive enough in the face of 
on the one hand, various threats to orthodox life for young people, and on the other hand, providing a positive context in which orthodox students can interact and learn the faith and learn the, their subjects that they should be learning at their various ages. We seek to um, have orthodoxy in, at the, as the foundation and the lens at, at, of all the classes and the lens through which we look at everything. So even if we're teaching Shakespeare, if my, if my literature teacher is teaching Shakespeare, she refers back to orthodox themes regularly and the students look at the literature um, in a, an orthodox way and approach it in that fashion. And that's true across the curriculum, whether it's composition, um, whether it's a, the classes I teach, apologetics for the, uh, for the high school student, or the history for the orthodox Christian, we're always trying to relate it back to the faith not that everything is ecclesiastical, but that we begin to see the secular things through an, with an orthodox mindset. And what would you say was, uh, or what would you say were some of the hardest parts of starting the initiative when you first began? Uh, an unbelievable amount of work. Yeah, <laughs> I would imagine. <laughs> um, I mean, honestly, I think people, from the beginning, people liked the idea of the initiative, but, uh, it was cer it's certainly been, it was an uphill battle because uh, there was a lot of questions about whether or not we had the resources to be able to do something like this in our church, et cetera. But, um, you know, we, did, we saw it as effectively a form of asceticism. You know, the, uh, uh, the staff and I looked at it as something we needed to push ourselves to do for the sake of our youth, uh, despite our sinfulness or unworthiness or our imperfections, and we just, you just keep pushing, right? Um, so, but, but that all being said, because it was more or less unprecedented in, in our eparchy, um, it was an uphill battle for a number of years to get it on the stable ground it's presently on. Uh, what's something you would say makes the initiative stand out from other education-based programs, would you say? Uh, so by that, like you mean like public or private school? Yeah, like, an, like a secular education, I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think, one of the things I want to say here is that there's no, as a premise, is that there's no such thing as ideologically neutral education. Everybody comes to education with some set of premises that they're working from. Um, historically in the United States, that set of premises was um, sort of the, the Protestant American outlook. And for a long time, that was more or less okay for the Orthodox Christian. I mean, you could, in the 50s, for example, you could go to school, they would begin the day with the Our Father. Um, morality was pretty consistent on a, on a societal basis. And the goals of education in the United States in public education or private education was to create uh, good sit American citizens that could participate in the Republic. But I think what's happened is, is that we have, we're no longer clear about what our telos, our purpose is. And so we're, what does St. James say? The, the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So we're going in all these directions. So what we wanted was an educational approach, a curriculum uh, that was, was very clear about its purpose. Number one, that we want to um, uh, provide Orthodox children with the foundations they need to deal with the contemporary world. And number two, that we want to make them functional human beings. Um, I'll give you a scenario real quick. Please. If someone decides they, ha they have to bring their kid to public school because they're not able to do homeschooling mm -hmm. for whatever reason, yeah. um, and the kid learns something in school that is contradictory to orthodox belief, um, what is something the parent should do? So the thing is, we're always going to encounter errors. We'll encounter them at work, we'll encounter them with our friends, we encounter them in the church, we encounter them in school. If we can't hide in our houses and say, we can never have any errors, we can't be presented with any errors, but when, when the student in, in encounters a habit of mind that is destructive to the orthodox mindset, then we have to become more serious, more vigilant, and say prayerfully and cautiously, okay, how do I address this? Which may or may not mean homeschooling. So I, I, when I say that, I don't mean to say that therefore everyone has to homeschool because it's not the pastoral solution for everyone. But what I do mean to say is that the parent has to be all the more vigilant about well, what's being taught in school they have to make sure that they're spending time with their children after school. And they have to take pains if they do keep them in public or private school that are, that are presenting them with these errors, that they give them um, occasions to learn 
Orthodox catechism that's more than, say, a half hour in Sunday school on Sunday, so that they really understand their faith. You know, we obviously don't want our kids to be exposed to inappropriate things in, at schools, but at the same time, we also don't want them to be super close-minded to yeah. new ideas. Um, so what is something people can do, I guess, to maintain an open mind but also stay steadfast in their beliefs? That's a difficult question. Um, it requires, you know, this is why St. John Cashin says that discretion is the governing virtue or the queen of the virtues. So I can't, I don't think I can say something formulaic about that. What I do say is, um, I think the fundamental problem of modern life, and Metropolitan Moses, our hierarchical overseer, actually talked about this in a, a video he put out recently, which you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, the fundamental problem is the compartmentalization of modern life. In a certain sense, that's what it means to be modern. You know, in, for a medieval man, in, at bottom, everything was theological. But for modern man, we created this compartmentalization whereby we have the secular and the spiritual, which is how you ended up with a situation where Protestants would have church for 45 minutes on Sunday and the rest of the day, the rest of the week, you know, I do work and I watch NASCAR, right? Um, so the Orthodox Christian has to understand that orthodoxy is a way of life. And so those things that threaten that way of life, especially habits, so there's, there's the question of error, but there's even more deeply the question of habits of mind. Those habits of mind that threaten that way of life are the things we have to be most vigilant about. I also, I also just wanted to step back just a little bit here because we d we're talking about public school and homeschooling a little bit. Sure, sure. Um, so if we can, if maybe you can just define what those are, because some people don't really know what homeschooling is exactly. Well, broadly understood, homeschooling is simply that you, for one reason or another, parents take their, their children out of the public or private schools and decide to educate them at home um, themselves, which um, my wife and I personally, we've always homeschooled um, for the reasons I already stated. Um, but as I want to stress, it is, it is something that has a lot of pastoral complexity to it because homeschooling is something that is very difficult. Um, it's very good, I think, but it's very difficult. And I think that therefore both spouses have to be completely on the, on the same page about it and ready to engage in the enterprise of, of the difficulties associated with it. And I think that there has to be the situation, the circumstances to create the regularity of a school, um, a, a school life where the, the, the classes are happening at certain times and the students are progressing at, at a certain rate, et cetera. With respect to the public school, um, and this poses some difficulties because unfortunately the courts over the last few decades have um, safeguarded the secrecy of the classrooms to a high degree. Um, but they should be very active. If they, if they have their children in public school, they should be very active in, in the school. They should know their teachers. They should, they should be participating in the, in the, uh, the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association, or whatever the equivalent of it, of it is in your area. Um, and they have to make sure that they have the time to have a strong relationship with their children, which I think is uh, perhaps all the more difficult because historically uh, we didn't have both parents working in the last 50 years or so. That's become a norm. Um, we also, the cell phone has taken over our time to um, an extensive degree. Um, it's funny, as an aside, I, I hear people talk about transhumanism and this and that case, but nobody thinks about the cell phone that's constantly in their hands. So the reason I bring that up is that what we see as parents, and I just saw this in an article the other day, that parents are now spending more time with their cell phones than their children. Um, and so the parent has to take themselves, make, be accountable, or hold themselves accountable. They have to say, am I spending enough time actively engaged with my child? Have I given them an iPad as their babysitter when they're three or four in church, or do I sit there and try to pray with them, right? Um, when I'm in the car, do we uh, talk or even play the alphabet game or some car game, or do we have them watching a movie in the back? So, you know, there's the threats of public school, which are very real, and we can go on at a great length about, um, or even some, a lot of liberal private schools. But there's also the threats of our own passions as parents, interfering with proper uh, child care. So that's on the side of schooling. On the, in terms of the initiative, what we've done this year is actually create an after-school program. 
um, precisely so um, that students who for whatever reason can't participate in the day program um, can participate in these after school offerings along with our day program students. So we, we've had, we now have classes in Byzantine chant for children, modern Greek, catechism, and other classes uh, in order to address this need to, for parents especially who don't feel they can take them out of school, but to combat that compartmentalization of life, where they're, they're, they're now they're engaging in church and with, with their friends from church regularly throughout the week. I was thinking too, so as a teacher, um, when you have all these students, um, of course there's the idea that some people learn visually, some people learn audibly. Um, as a teacher, how do you take that into, into account when you have students, especially in the initiative? Yeah, so um, it's funny that you mentioned that because Martin Gardner, who introduced that idea, um, said it was rather misunderstood because he, he said, I didn't mean that people could only learn, say, visually or otherwise or audibly or kinesthetically, but rather that those are their greatest strengths and that those other things should still be developed. So what we try to do in the initiative is to develop all of these different aspects. So, for example, we will frequently give, we give children a, um, an exercise to do. We'll make sure that they're writing it out by hand and not typing it. And that works. There are some students that um, are kinesthetic, primarily kinesthetic learners, and that's very helpful to them. But we urge them to read it out loud as they're doing it. There's been a lot of research that shows, actually, that these time-honored methods of education, as opposed to typing notes, um, for example, really are much better in terms of a, a facilitating memory and so forth. So what we try to do is engage the whole person, in short, in their learning. Would you say, this is another idea that pops up a lot nowadays, would you say that nowadays current generation is not as smart as previous generations? Because <laughs> you know how nowadays they're always saying that uh, everyone's dumber now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to sound like the old guy that's talking about people walking up school, uphill both ways to school. But um, no, th there's, there are studies, so if you put aside our anecdotal information about the matter, there are studies that show this, actually. Um, as of 15 or 16 years ago, I saw a study that, that, that argued or that the um, vocabulary of the average eighth grader uh, 20 years prior was greater than the high school senior that was graduating at that juncture. That's, I think that that's, it's incontestable that that's the case. Um, that shouldn't cause us to despair because we can fix it with, I mean, this has happened before in history, it's not unprecedented, and we can fix it with hard work and prayer. But yes, I think in short, there is, there is that problem. Part of the problem in the American context, at least, is our attachment to, to pragmatism. So learning more meaningful things, the more, the more pragmatic Americans became, more, learning more meaningful things got pushed by the wayside because really we're just trying to get a piece of paper for money. Um, so I think that's a factor. I think people shy away from more meaningful discussion and in inquiry because really they're just saying, well, I need to get a piece of paper so I can make money so I can send my kids to get a piece of paper to make money, right? Um, so, but the, so I think that's one factor. The other factor in our contemporary context is um, that we are attached to our devices. We don't read enough. Um, and we really need to read a lot more than we do. I mean, we're, we're literate as a society, generally speaking, in terms of just can you read, but whether or not we read regularly is a very different question. Um, the other thing, as I would say, is that the, the models in the 1960s based on self-esteem were flawed. Um, we shouldn't be looking so much for self-esteem. We should be looking for sanctification through education. There's a very good book now from New Rome Press, um, St. Itarios from uh, On Mind and Heart, and it discusses actually the importance of education um, for Orthodox Christians. And, and I think it, it nicely delineates, St. Nectarios nicely delineates the significance of classical education and how it can be used by the church. I, I've heard this argument from a few people actually where they say um, they're kind of against education because they sort of look at it in a few ways. One is kind of they feel like people who have degrees are elitist. And they also say that, well, this, many of the saints didn't have Edu like formal education, so it's not really necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, then again, there are also many saints who did have formal education. <laughs> so, the, yeah. yeah, I mean, the preponderance of our writings come in the church come from saints with formal education. Yeah. Um, you know, in order to be a good Orthodox Christian, um, well, maybe I should convey what I'm about to say with an anecdote. 
when we began the initiative, you asked me about the challenges we had initially. This is actually one of the challenges we had, was this very set of line of questioning. And someone said to me, Father John, you know, there's been so many saints who were just simple, and they gained their salvation. Um, so why can't we do that? And I said, well, examine their lives. Um, they, many of them got up at 3 o'clock in the morning, did the midnight office, did matins, you know. Uh, and then they worked really hard agricultural. Uh, they worked out in the fields all day long. And then they ended their day with vespers. These are lay people. I'm not talking about monastics necessarily, right? These are just lay people. And they didn't have running water. They had to go to the well to get water. So they had all these austerities associated with their lives. So it would make sense that they sort of can pull vault over, by means of grace and asceticism, pull vault over the need for reading, learning from a book. Um, so I said, if you... It, if we're ready to do that, then maybe we wouldn't need that. Maybe we don't need books in that case. You know, a lot, of, a lot of learning. But if we're not ready to do that, then we have to humbly look for knowledge in books, just as so many of the saints did, like St. Saint Basil, like St. John Chrysostom, right? like St. Photius the Great, like St. John of Damascus. Um, and are we going to say that they ran the risk of elitism? That seems like a big statement to me. You know? Yeah. And I think, too, uh, there are some people when they look, uh, because there are simple people, <laughs> you know? Right, right. And they'll look, at, they'll look at education. Maybe they'll even sit in, and, you know, they'll sit in on a theology class or something, and they won't understand anything, and they'll think, oh, I'm, I must be a lesser Orthodox Christian because I don't get the words that are being used here. Um, if somebody, let's say, is a tradesman, and they just, they like to learn some things, they know their faith, but they don't, they don't read theology, but they go to, they go to work, as they're working, they're saying their Jesus prayer. They're not listening to, I don't know, you know, death metal or something, but they're saying their Jesus prayer, etc. Um, they read the scriptures, because of course everybody should be reading the scriptures. I mean, regardless of whether we're simple or not, right? Um, they go to church, etc. Well, that's obviously a path to sanctification. And, you know, perhaps they had some deficit intellectually that didn't allow them to study more. There's no deficit there. Now, take someone else, though, that God didn't give them those kinds of tools, no pun intended. They don't have the, the aptitude, perhaps, to work with their hands. But for whatever reason, God in his ineffable wisdom g gave them the uh, ability to read, to write, to talk to people. Um, so as long as they're following the examples of the saints who did those things, I can't see how that would be a bad thing to pursue because each man has his gift and therefore each man has his calling. So for people who do feel that they're not smart enough to understand theology, um, how should they go about, um, how should they look at education, I guess? We should always be doing the best we can to learn what we can, and to the degree to which we can't, then taking refuge in humility. So I don't, my, you know, my father is a plumber, and he's a carpenter as well, and he can do some electric, and he knows how to do all sorts of things. He can, <laughs> to me, it looks like working miracles with, with his hands. And I, I do not have those talents. And I, but whenever I see somebody with those talents, I think that's terrific that they have those talents. And, and see, the reason God didn't give everybody the same talents is so that we have to be a body. Because what does St. Paul say? Does the, does the hand say to the foot, I have no need of thee? Right? The church is in need of all these various types of people. Education is sort of a proving ground or a testing ground to see where we belong. But when we say where we belong, it doesn't mean that the intellectual is necessarily higher than the man or the woman who does manual labor. It's rather to say, um, this is what God, I've tried these various things. God blessed these things for me to do these things and didn't bless those other things. And as long as we're abiding in virtue and seeking after grace, then it's not a question of better or worse. It's a question of where God wanted you to be. Do you have any advice for students on how to stay motivated to continue studying and continue learning about the faith? Or, you know, just any, any, any classes? Any, really? About the faith first. Well, yeah, about the faith or just, you know, about even math, <laughs> you know, just to stay motivated yeah. to keep working, to improve um, yourself, you know? Right. So, I th well, let's start with the faith. Mm -hmm. And I guess th the first advice I have is for parents before the youth, which is that as parents, we absolutely have to see that our first responsibility, and in a certain sense, our last responsibility, is to
to bequeath uh, the Orthodox faith to our children. And that means, you know, I think St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain says somewhere in his writings that children cannot, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like, children cannot learn how to struggle if they do not see their parents engaged in their own interior struggle. And so that, and that doesn't mean perfection on the part of the parents. It means struggle. It means, it might even mean that they see the parent have a bad day and use foul language and then pick themselves up and say, you know, I shouldn't have spoken that way and start again. Because so much of the spiritual life is picking yourself up and starting again. But if the, if the children see the parents engaged in a secular life, the likelihood is that the children will be engaged in a secular life, right? Okay, so there's that first, I think, admonition, right? The second thing is, is that young, the St. Philaret, the new confessor, in his book on the moral law of God, which was written for you, the youth of our church, he quotes um, Ecclesiasticus, which says, I believe in the seventh chapter, remember thy death and thou shalt not sin unto the ages. And this is something that even children should have in front of them, that we're going to die. God allowed death precisely so that each moment is, of, of, is priceless. And children need to think this way. This is how children ran to their martyrdom uh, in the lives of the saints, because they realized that the way to the resurrection is through death. And the significance of each moment is to realize that not take it for granted. So if children, especially teenagers, reflect and say, someday I'm going to die, this doesn't have to be a cause for morbidity. This is a cause to realize the significance of the resurrection and to pursue it. And the more that we immerse ourselves in the services and the reading of the lives of the saints and the scriptures, the more we see that. Yeah, and, and what's your, in relation to motivation, what's your process of getting people excited to learn? Excited to learn. As a teacher. Well, for myself, um, well, in, in, I, in general in the initiative, I emphasize conversation to a high degree. You know, John Henry Newman um, and the idea of the university, I think I said this actually to, to the folks in Nigeria when we were talking um, online. Um, he said, um, if I had a choice to get rid of the cafeteria or the classrooms, then I would get rid of the classrooms. Because the, the first place that education really starts is with the conversation. The conversation between the teacher and the student. The conversation between the student and the student. The conversation between the student and a text. Because the text is not something disembodied. The text they're reading was written by a human being just like them. And in a certain sense, when they're reading, they should be engaging in the text conversationally. So this is where the initiative classes begin and end with conversation. Um, and and in, the one, in one way, setting the student at ease to converse, while another way, in another way, holding them accountable to have to, to, have to converse um, and engage what we're learning. What's your process for when someone um when someone's really struggling in a class that you have, what's your process to sort of let them know that, you know, hey, I'm here to help you, but at the same time you need to work harder, maybe? Right, yeah. right. So, so we, we don't, we, we try to be um, direct with the students about how they need to improve. Um, I tend to take, uh, unless a student is just being completely irresponsible, I very rarely just chastise. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually, that's not my primary place to go. What I, what I generally, uh, the way I might sound is more like a, a football coach giving you the talk before a big game um, when I have a student that's not performing well. I'll, I'll make time to talk to them on their own uh, and, and I'll ask them, what, what's important to you? Um, why do you think this is important? Is it important? And why or why not? And then we go from there. And then usually th they very rarely will say, this, is, this, this isn't important. Um, and then, and then we go from there and I say, well, if it is important, then you have to work at it. Well, it's hard. This is where we find the cross. This is why education is a path to asceticism. Because when we encounter a subject that's difficult and humbles us, and we realize, oh, I can't, I can't understand this. Or I can only understand it with great difficulty. But we know it's something that if I learn, I can help the church, I can help my family. And we push ourselves and we ask God, please help me. We may not become the most intelligent people ever, but we might learn it enough to help the person next to us, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, you clearly enjoy teaching, so I was, <laughs> I was wondering what is something, what, what is it about teaching that brings you joy? Um, 
Well, in my opinion, a, a, a good teacher is just a good learner who loves what they've learned so much that they want to share it. That's what, that's what gives me joy. Uh, when I was a little kid, I would learn something, and I'd say, I'll show you. I'll show you. Like, I'll, I saw something at the museum. I'll show you, you know. Um, so to me, it's a, it's, a, it's a type of sharing. You know, I can't cook, but I can, I can help you with something I've learned. So. You can teach us how to cook, but you <laughs> no, I can't teach you how to cook. My son Joseph probably could, but I, I can't teach you how to cook. But I can't teach you, I guess what I meant to say there is I can't, I can't make you a good meal. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, but, but, although I know how to grill well, um, but I can, I can teach you something that will help you. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that, to me, that's the best thing. Because, um, you know, if, if you make something for somebody that is just physical, it's going to break down at some point. It's going to be gone. But if you teach somebody something that helps them 25 years later, that's pr or the rest of their lives, that's priceless. And so to me, that's everything. When someone comes to you with a question that is difficult for you to answer, or maybe you don't know the answer at the time, what, what's, what usually, what's your response to that? So when I was 12, I had this teacher, Mr. Masto. And he, um, he said, he said, the first day of school, he said, in this classroom, we learn how to learn. And I, I kind of, my ears picked up, pricked up, and I, wait, what does that mean? I didn't even ask him. I was just sort of thinking about it. And I spent years thinking about it after he said it. And what I realized is, in a certain sense, it's like that adage, right? You give a man a fish, he eats for a day. Um, um, you know, you teach a man to fish, he eats for his lifetime. So, so now getting back to the question of a question that, doesn't seem easily answerable. So what I do is I'll say, I'll even say to the student, that's a tough question and it's not easily answered. But let's start, let's start talking about what we would need to do to answer the question because I want them to learn how to learn. We can only go to school uh, for a certain number of years. And so it's imperative that we learn how to learn because they're always going to be encountering problems later in life that requires us to learn. So one of the things I also try to emphasize, and this I, th I think fits in with what I think is the orthodox approach to education, is that um, so when we learn, like everything else in life, we're trying to learn in order to gain our salvation. So if you have a question that's quite deep and perhaps is an, on a certain level ineffable, we can't fully answer it, we don't necessarily need to learn to comprehend the subject matter of the question. We need to apprehend it to such a degree that we can gain our salvation. And this is, I think, where humility comes in um, and, and, and where we want to reject rationalism, which is to say that learn, the purpose of learning is as an aid to sanctification like everything else that we do in the spiritual life. And so we might not ever become St. Paisius the Great in terms of our fasting, but we, keep, we strive to keep the canonical fasts. We may not be the best fasters out there, but we strive to do what we can to gain our salvation. And it's like this with learning. There are going to be some things that we can't answer, either as a group of people, as human beings, or as an individual person. Um, but we don't have to understand everything about it. We have to know what we need to understand where we're at, where God has allowed us to be. Mm -hmm. and, and you're a teacher in kind of many forms. You're a priest. <laughs> teacher, right, right. You're, a, uh, you're a parent teacher, <laughs> right. you're also a literal teacher. <laughs> right. You know, how, do you, how do you balance all of those? <laughs> when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I hope humor is okay on the show. That's, that's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, no, I mean, you know, the thing is, is that the balance itself is a struggle. And, and um, I see it as an occasion for, for humility um, and, and for prayer. Um, I don't have a perfect balance. Um, so each day I try to say, well, what does God require of me today? And, and then I'll look a little bit ahead, you know, to the week, to the month, to the semester. Um, but, but I try to remind myself that sufficient unto the day are the evils thereof, and then just work through step by step. That doesn't mean I always do that successfully. Um, and then at the end of the day, just like we do, everybody does, we're, we're everybody's supposed to do, we're supposed to reflect on where we went wrong and, and, and maybe what went well so you know to repeat it. I just do that in those contexts. You know, where did I go wrong today? Where did I overdo it? Where did I underdo it? Um, and then just try to prayerfully recalibrate. And I think that's all anybody can do.
can you recall a moment in your life as a teacher where you had like a breakthrough moment with a student? Like a, maybe a student was really not <laughs> understanding something and then finally they did and it was kind of like this big moment of like, wow, we got there. Um, it happened in different ways. I mean, when I taught public school, there were one sort of breakthrough I was looking for. You know, I remember this one student I had really struggled with dyslexia, but he was, he had a lot, I could tell by his participation in class, he had a lot of potential um, for argumentation in a good sense, for being well-spoken, and I just kept working with him. Um, and, and he's a lawyer now. Um, you know, and I, but I didn't start him out by thinking about the law. You know, I, I engaged him about philosophy and ethics, and because um, I think those things are prior or should be prior to law, and and then we just went step by step. And he, because he was in my history classes, and I taught a law elective at the time, he began to be interested in the law, and then he pursued law school later on. So th to me, that was a big victory on a sort of a secular level, um, because a student who came from difficult circumstances, like myself, actually. Um, and, and had an uphill battle with, with in his case, dyslexia, which I, which I don't have, but, but I, have other, I had other uphill battles when I was growing up. He was able to overcome them and, uh, and become a functional member of society. So that was, to me, that was a big victory. You said you had eight kids, right? Yeah, so I yeah, counted. Yeah, eight kids. Um, how did you do that? As in, how do you take care of them? <laughs> <laughs> like, eight kids is a lot. <laughs> um, so, you know, having, and this might sound bad, but just to hear me out, so having, having the, the, ki the children that God allows for you is, is the asceticism of married people, by which I mean it checks your will. And it makes you realize that you can't do everything. Um, you know, I think because of the secularization of our society, we try to plan everything to the hilt. Um, and certainly there are things that we ought to plan. Um, but, but, you know, um, the, we, we had our first child in the first year of our marriage. Um, and then they, they came very, very frequently after that. And uh, it was a wonderful blessing. It, and it really is what, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, how do we mature in these times? How do we become a man, right, and so forth? And how do we become a woman? Nothing will mature you more, and nothing will be a greater education for you in the world, if you're in the world, than uh, marrying someone that you really want to work out your salvation with and, and having children with them and trying to be trying, striving to be a good Orthodox husband or wife and a good Orthodox father, father or mother. That's the, great, that's the greatest form of education for people in the world. Everything stems from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've heard, actually I've heard many people say this, um, they talk about how they don't really want to have kids because they feel that the world is getting too evil and that doing that would, you know, it would be bad for the child to live in a world like this. Yeah, um, I've heard this argument a lot of times. Yeah. Well, yeah. What would you say to someone who kind of has this sort of a, that view on things right now? Well, I, I think that that shows an excessive degree of wanting to, to exercise an excessive degree of control. I mean, if someone says, this world is vain, and I want to then reject it and become a monastic, well, that's different, right? Because what does it say in Jeremiah? Um, greater the ch number of children of those in the desert than of her that has a husband, right? So, so that's, a, that's a, a different sort of, that's, that's a different sort of, a, a more exalted form of carrying the cross and finding the resurrection even in this fallen world. But if we're living in the midst of the world and we, we reject ha uh, marriage and children um, because of the darkness, it means we haven't seen the light of the resurrection in the middle of the world. We have to, we have to, it means we have to repent and, and learn the significance of the good tidings to a greater degree. And the initiative, so is, is, does it start off with kindergarten age? No, no, we start, age? you mean now? Yeah, yeah as of now. Uh, now we have first graders. Oh, first graders, okay. Um, yeah. And it goes all the way up to, to, to the senior year of high school. The reason I said no is initially we didn't have elementary school students. Um, we, because when we were first starting the initiative and given the fact that um, it's, it's presently uh, delivered on Zoom, I was uncomfortable with the possible classroom management issues that would be presented with very young children in the Zoom environment. Especially at that juncture, I didn't have a, a, a certified elementary school teacher that, that, that I felt was of the same mindset. But we, we, we found one, we hired one, and then we started running elementary school classes, and now we have 
students, the youngest student we have is six. Mm. So uh, well, that's pretty three young. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> With the initiative, you have all these, uh, you know, these these kids there. Um, what would you say is the most rewarding thing about teaching all of these children? The seeing their smiles. Um, I think that a lot of us don't realize how isolated our 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 youth are. Um, that we many of us live far away from church. Many of us have um, taken on this sort of secularization that I've referred to, and so we only really interact with church people on Sundays. And the byproduct of this is that, or the result of this, is that many of our youth don't have enough friends that are that are other Orthodox Christians. And when you see them get together and learn together, and they just feel relaxed, that they're that they're not embattled the way they might feel in public school or the way they feel in other contexts. And they're, they know we're all just orthodox and we're struggling uh, and, they're, and they're at peace. And then you see them at St. Xenia's and they're all kind of running to each other, hey, I'm seeing you in person. The, it's, it, that's the most rewarding thing, even more than the learning the, the, learning the particular subjects. Um, the fact that they're, they're living together in unity um, is, is, again, priceless. So I think that's the, the most important thing. The second thing is obviously the, um, probably obviously the, um, the progress you see, even in the students that struggle. You know, you, you could see marked progress um, uh, in, the, in the student's ability from the time, say, they're 12 to the time they're 15. And when you see that, and you see that it's, it's a function of the, everybody working together, because I don't... I'm not possessive of teaching and the initiative. I'm always looking for new help. I don't always have the, the budget to hire new help, but I'm always looking for new help because I'm trying to build a community of learners and a, and a community of teachers um, for the primary and secondary levels. And um, so when you see the effects on the student, you can see how they're developing because of the, the impact of all of the classes together. That's wonderful because it means we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, even if it's imperfect. And what are some ways you hope the seminary and the initiative are able to collaborate together? Well, I, I think that in an overarching sense, we have the same mission um, in terms of looking to, I think the seminary also exists to create a community of learners and teachers at the post-secondary secondary level. Um, I, I, uh, I think we share the same commitments to education, Orthodox education, which I think is Im absolutely imperative for so many different reasons. Um, and, and so I see the role there as one of great complementarity between the initiative and the seminary uh, in our church, training, not only training in terms of training clergy, um, but in terms of training teachers and, and you know, catechists and even parish council people that will know what the priest is talking about when they're trying to deal with something in the parish over time. So, so I, I think that the, uh, that's one of the reasons I love teaching for, for both institutions. You know, I run the initiative and teach for it and do a lot of other things. And then I teach for, sp for the seminary. Um, and I, I love being able to operate in both of those contexts. And if I'm a parent who has a kid and I hear about the initiative, how can I take some classes there? Uh, to, for the parent to take the class, you mean? Um, or the children to take the class? I guess both, actually. Both. Okay, so with yeah. respect to the children, what we always want them to do is to call us. Uh, the number's right on the website. Um, and talk to us about what they're doing presently and what they think they need. And so the first conversation really is trying to sort out how we can help them um, in their particular circumstances. Um, and then we make a recommendation about what classes would probably be good. Um, for, for the student in question. We, uh, depending on the circumstances, uh, we'll frequently have them speak to individual teachers um, so that the teacher can get a sense of where they're at presently, academically, which sometimes is difficult with homeschooled students to know where they're at, which is why we go through this, this process to try to place them appropriately where they belong in the classes. And then we go from there. Um, with respect to offerings for the parents, you know, the, the adult discussion groups uh, we have began during the COVID shutdown. Um, and so what those are designed to do is to get the adults and especially the parents of our eparchy studying uh, important spiritual works more seriously in their, in their spare time. Not so much as classes, but as discussion groups. 
Um, the reasoning there is, is that if children don't see their parents studying in their spare time, they won't think it's important. So we have to, in this sense, the initiative is sort of undertaking two missions because we, we want to revitalize the, or to create a proper commitment to spiritual reading among our adults so that the, the children follow their example. So we invite um, adults to participate in those discussion groups um, they're very laid back. There's not tests. They just read and we discuss. Um, but that's, that's something that the adults can get involved with as well. And we have a lot of involvement. Usually, sometimes in Lent, we have up to 50 adults at a time in those mm. classes. What is one of the most common questions you get about the initiative <sighs> when you do on your travels? Why? Why do we need it? Um, you know, I think as you mentioned earlier, I think one of the difficulties there is it's very easy to become negative very quickly about the why. You know, well, the, it's because of what's going on in the schools. And that's certainly an impetus to action. I mean, that is the thing that made, it, made, made us think, right? But on a deeper level, we have to think about, okay, so our society has ended up in this place, this situation with what's going on in the schools in terms of everything we know about and the, the, the agenda that are being pursued, and they are being pursued. But there's an underlying spiritual cause uh, for that, and we have to note that it, partly our own indifference and our own lack of repentance, we allowed ourselves, even in the church, to become too secularized and to become neither hot nor cold. And that doesn't mean, when I say that, not beating up on anybody, that just, that's, I'm putting that in front of all of us, myself included, and saying we have to try to fix that. We have to, again, uh, uh, strive more deeply to understand why the gospel is the good tidings, right, and, and the, the significance of the faith in our life in the middle of this fallen world. Father John, thank you so much for coming on to the show. Um, I really hope that the seminary and the initiative can do more collaborations. I mean, for example, this episode right here is a collaboration. Indeed. Between, um, and you're a teacher here at the seminary, and we hope that you're able to come here in person more often because we really like when you're out here. So do I. I love being here. And if anybody has any questions about anything I've said, please reach out. Feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much for watching Tea Time at the Seminary. If you like what you saw today, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel called St. Photios Orthodox Theological Seminary. Cheers.